So I remember when I was, uh, I don't know, probably, I know I was in elementary school, and I saw for the first time this movie. You ready for this? It was a classic movie. It was made in 1939. That's not when I saw it. But um, <laughs> I remember watching this movie. It was one of the largest selling movies, one of the most popular movies, continues to be of all time, called The Wizard of Oz. Anybody remember seeing that movie? Did you see that movie? Yes. In Brazil? Yeah, I was seeing Brazil. In Portuguese. In Portuguese. Wow. Yeah, it was fun. <laughs> It was a summer movie. Every summer, it will show like two or three times. And I will get scared two or three times yeah. a month. <laughs> I remember as a kid, that was me too. It just, it just freaked me out, the idea of these poor people. One guy needed a brain. One guy needed a heart. One guy needed courage. And poor Dorothy. And I'm from the Midwest, right? So the whole thing of getting carried away by a tornado, that was real to me. <laughs> I mean, I'm serious, man. You, you didn't mess with tornadoes because you woke up the next morning and your car was gone and it was eight blocks over. And so whoever thought that up really tapped into the Midwest psyche there a little bit. But, um, but I remember thinking these poor people and this guy, remember Oz? Just, you know, and they would kind of, you know, do some things and kind of make some steps forward and he would show up and shut the whole thing down, this roaring voice, right, from behind the curtain. And I just remember thinking, whoever that guy is, he's, he's not nice, he's nasty. Freaked me out as a kid. And I'll never forget the moment, and this is the part I'm telling you is etched in my memory, when, was it the dog that pulled the curtain back, Toto or whatever? And it was just this wimpy little guy just talking into a, uh, pulling levers and, you know, kind of that, that shock and awe sort of a thing. But he was just a wimp. He was just like a, and I thought to myself, man, really? And I thought of that movie as we were getting ready for this morning. Let's pray. <laughs> Fathers, we look into this idea of conspiracy of evil. Uh, we ask that you'd open our eyes. We ask that you would pull back the curtain and show us what's behind all the noise. You'd show us what's behind the intimidation, what's behind the things that move us, that cause us to tremble, that perhaps are just really... Imitation power, imitation words, imitation, counterfeit truth. In our own lives, I pray you'd stop us this morning and catch us and show us what you want us to see. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, so last week we, we, we were talking about Adam and Eve, how the, this enemy came into the garden and, and like... He, he, he messed up with God's plan, not in the way like God lose control, but he, he has this idea of rebellion against God. And, and he made the way that Adam and Eve fall into this plan by, by in this conversation and, and mm -hmm. of, and, and, I, and I went, as you read there, you will see, the, that God creates the man and the woman in his own likeness. There was nothing that you need more. If you, if, if you think about Adam and Eve, they don't need any extra input because they, they have everything. But then the this, this snake or this, I don't know, come and say, hey, if you eat this, you're not going to die. You're going to be like God. And the, this temptation of more, it, it is as soon as they ate, the Bible say their eyes were open, and the first thing they did, it was hide. They hide from God, they hide from one another, and then it's, it's, the, start, it's the starting of the story of fear. Now, remember the story that God say, Adam, and where are you? And then it, it is like, you know, playing hide and seek with kids. They go behind the curtains and their feet is down and you're like, oh, where are you? I can't find you. And you look at their feet. You know, God is like, where are you behind the bush? And, and Adam and Eve is like, we were afraid. Is that why we hide? And, and there's the fear comes into the story and, 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 and starts to guide people 
that you will see continues in the Bible, most of the things were, were made out of fear and this hiding idea. I don't know, it's interesting that in the very next chapter, chapter just a chapter four, the sons of Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, encounter a different beast. In the garden, Adam and Eve encountered this serpent being uh, that talked to them and they conversed with him and it was their downfall, but now there's another beast. But this beast isn't like a physical thing in front of them, but um, think about what I'm saying. I I think Adam and Eve literally, I'm I'm semi-fundamentalist in this sense that they were talking to some being, uh, something they could see. But I think now we have Cain and Abel are having a conversation and, and they encounter a beast, but this beast is not visible. So Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. So one was a, seemed like one was a farmer gardener, the other was more of a husbandman, uh, flocks and so forth. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. And the Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. Uh, we don't know exactly all the background, why that might have been, lots of speculation, but the fact is somehow uh, Cain was out of sync with something that God had desired. And so Cain was very angry. So Cain encounters something, or Cain describes something that's going on inside him called anger. And this anger, uh, God warns him about. The Lord says to Cain, why are you angry? Why does your face look like that, downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? So God steps in and sort of tries to help Cain see this beast that is wanting access to him. He says, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? If you do not do what is right, sin, this beast, is crouching at your door, and it desires. So and the, the God almost, the writers almost give this thing, it, it, it desires, whatever this is, it desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. And when they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Obviously did not listen. And the Lord said to Cain, where's your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. This is the classic human response. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground and now you're under a curse. You're driven from the ground which opened his mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops. You'll be a restless wanderer on the earth. And Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is more than I can bear. Today you're driving me from the land and I will be hidden from your presence. I will be a restless wanderer and whoever finds me will kill me. And so you see this incredible paranoia that comes over this man because of the blood of his, his own brother, because of his disobedience, because this beast, this anger, triumphed over him. God said, no, I'll put a mark on you so that no one finds you would kill you. And Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. It would be interesting if it got better. But um, what you read now from Genesis 4 all the way to Genesis 11 is just the downward spiral of human behavior and human activity. Now, if you haven't read Genesis, it's an interesting read. There is a lot of colorful stories in Genesis 5 to 11, let me tell you. There's Babylon, well, excuse me, there's the fall, the flood. There is kind of, there's these spirit beings and, and, and human beings having relationships with one another and so on and so forth. We'll probably get to that another time, but I want to just fast forward to Genesis 11 because through it all, we don't know how much time has gone by, several generations, and we get to this thing in Genesis 11 now where a group of people have come together and they've come together around an idea. Remember remember we said that uh, the enemy came, this being came at Adam and Eve, not with a weapon, but with an idea. And once that idea bore fruit, once that idea was acted upon, it became a behavior that caused a fall. Well, here are these group of people in Genesis 11. Here's what they say. Come, let us build ourselves a city, it says on this plain. And we're going to build a tower, and it's going to reach to the heavens. Why? So that we will make a name for ourselves, and otherwise we're going to be scattered over the face of the whole earth. So again, you see this fear at play. 
But what they're doing is saying, we're going to gather human beings. We're going to come together in unity. It doesn't matter what stripe of politician you are. We're going to come together so that we will not be scattered and we're going to make a name for ourselves and we're going to build a tower that reaches to the heavens. This is the beginning of what is called Babylon because God stepped in and said, not now, not yet. And he confused the languages from there and they began to babble because they couldn't understand. And it's the beginnings of what we know as Babylon. Yeah, and, and we see that this idea become, you know, if you look at it in the beginning, it was, it was a, Adam and Eve was just the two of them and then Cain. But then the, the, Dolph, the fall becomes not more related to one people, but to the whole humanity to the point where God has to, through Noah, to destroy everything and it restart again. And, in, and then later one we see again. And then we see this idea of the Babylon becomes not just in the Bible, become not just a people group of that always trying to go against God and, and become God's enemy, but the Bible relates to Babylon as a, as, a, as a spiritual thing as well. It will see in Revelation when God will destroy this Babylon again, but there is not a group of people, but there's a spirit behind that, that we always gonna go against God's will. It, 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 what we're just trying to make us understand, as, as even when we're singing, let your kingdom come on earth, it's because there's this, this, there's reality that is beyond just us here and what we talk. There's the spiritual uh, realm uh, that it's, it's always fighting against God's will. It, it's the same as if, if you go to, to place, have you, have you go to place and then you feel this, the atmosphere on that place is different from where you come from. You know, it's, it's, if, if you go to, to Vegas, you will feel that there is something that is different from where you come from. You know, it's, it's, it's this cloud that goes over you. I, I shared a story last night. I, I, I grew up in, like in, in one city and then I moved to another one six hours far from where I grew up to, to, to the YWAM. And then from time to time, I used to go to my hometown where we work with my, my local church. And I remember like me and my wife in the car driving. And then as soon as I, I, I crossed the limit of my hometown, I've always felt this depression and this fear and, and this, you know when you compare yourself with other people and then you feel like you always don't have enough like everyone. And I remember every time I was in my hometown, I would feel this, this pressure, this I'm not good enough, I cannot provide for my family. And I go to my home church, it is like it's all the people trying to impress each other, having the, I have, oh, you bought the 2018 model, I bought the 2019. Oh, the, the, so it all this thing about money and what you have and what you don't have. And I remember even a guy came to me one day from my church and said, Daniel, there's some, something wrong what you do. He said, you talk about God, but look, your car is so old. It, it, it doesn't have a match between your old car with what you talk about God. And then as soon as we leave my hometown driving back, I will feel like free. It was like, there's something wrong. And I remember going in, I start to pray. And God said, Daniel, every time you walk into your hometown, that spirit of, you know, materialism, it is there waiting for everyone so that it can destroy people. And I remember saying, God, how do I f overcome this? And God said, by giving. You, you overcome that spirit by giving. No, you see the Bible, there's stories about spirit, uh, like wars. No, there's the war in Joseph as king. And then say, God put the worship team in front and say, sing. Have you go to a moment where you're depressed and then you start to sing worship? And then this, this crowd goes over your shoulders and you see the freedom. 
And I remember that what happened. I start to fight this spirit in my hometown by every time giving. And I was like, I, I don't care. My car is old. I I'm, I'm don't care about this. This is not what I'm working. I'm working for God, for his kingdom. So here, and then I remember one day going home and not feeling that feeling anymore. I was like, yeah, we overcome this. So this is what is what we are trying to understand together. There is something that's beyond, and like the enemy wants to go beyond our possession. He wants our faith. He wants our heart. And, and if we let him get, grab this one, you know, this is the war. It's, it's between this enemy that wants to destroy our faith. Babylon was the anti-Yahweh kingdom. And the spirit of Babylon remains the same. It's the anti-God kingdom. It'll use the same terminology. It's comfortable with terminology. But behind it is this spirit that says, you will not rule over me. You will not rule over me. And so what the Bible is teaching us, it tries to teach us, is that sin on a personal level breeds all kinds of ugly consequences. But there's also sin on a larger level Maybe an unseen level that Daniel's describing. I think we've all experienced this. I think we've walked into certain places and felt like, this is an uneasy place. This is a dark place. On the other hand, we've walked into places like this morning where we felt like, you know, we're kind of all in agreement here. And what we're in agreement with is that Jesus is Lord or Jesus is worthy. And you can actually, it's almost palatable. You can feel it, right? Paul would write from a prison cell in Rome, Paul would write these words. Paul is in prison, both at the hands of religion and state, in prison for his work. And he says, brothers, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power in Ephesians 6. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the schemes of the enemy, the ideas of the enemy, the flow. He says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Paul is writing these words in jail. Paul's writing these words to a church that lived at the crossroads, if you will, of, of, mod, of the modern world back then. Ephesus was full of commerce and fashion and politics and philosophy. And Paul says, if you find yourself fighting with people, I'm paraphrasing, you're not fighting the right battle because our, fle- our, our, fle- our struggle is not with flesh and blood but against the enemy's schemes, against rulers, against authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Paul's not here doing the Wizard of Oz thing, trying to scare us. He's trying to open our eyes to see another dimension. It's interesting, if you read the King James, your Bible will say against principalities. It uses the word principality. We use a word municipality. Principality is a prince of a piece of real estate. Isn't that interesting? Uh, Our brother here just got back from China and he was over there, um, uh, there was a business situation he was in, but we were, he was describing to me just the feeling of what it was like that was beyond just culture, right? Because there are princes over pieces of real estate. You've been to Las Vegas, go to downtown Chicago in certain areas at two in the morning, I'll I'll expose you to that feeling, what that's like will take you to the poor, the violent, the lustful places. And there's a group of people that have gathered around that idea. And Paul says, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything, you're going to still be standing. If I can read one more passage out of Colossians, just jumping over, same author, same idea, but listen to how he puts it. See to it that no one kidnaps you carries you away with hollow and deceptive philosophy that depends only on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world. He's describing the same thing. There are forces, there are ideas, clouds of ideas, flow of ideas that are all around us that wanna carry us away captive. Paul warned the church at Colossae, be careful that these ideas do not kidnap you For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. You you notice that none of the time, even Jesus or Paul, any 
author of the, of the New Testament, he's talking about like a political part of find, like Paul is not saying, look, our, our fight is not against so and so. And he, he's, he's saying, don't fight. And, and, I, and I, as I read it yesterday, I was like, oh, I wish Cain had read, read what Paul said, our fight is not against flesh and blood. Because he couldn't, he doesn't need to kill his brother for that. You know, because he was, uh, his fight was against the, the, the enemy. It's not against, it wasn't against his brother. And because the enemy has his schemes that how he want to come and then he, he, he will try to steal from us. And then one of this is the condemnation. The, the enemy will, will work on condemnation to make us feel bad. Like Cain, he, he, he became a fugitive. And then he, he was angry, and his anger was not because he didn't get what he wants. And he, 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 was, he, he thought like, God, you own me something. No, I, I offer you this, and you did it, so I get angry, and, and I, I will put my anger in my brother. So this, the, this way of the enemy, you will see the enemy will try always to steal by make us feel like the condemnation that the Bible says, and, and the, the works of the Holy Spirit is, is he, he doesn't come to bring condemnation. He comes to bring us, he, he, he reveals something wrong, but to bring us close to God, not away from God. Isn't that interesting? If, if stop and think for a minute, if the anger thing. I find myself, I'll react to people, but what I actually is going on is what he just described, Somebody owed me something that I didn't get. So I think what I would say to here this morning is, um, do you find yourself fighting with people like your spouse or your coworker or another political party or somebody that, because you just feel like somewhere inside I have this right to be. And according to Paul, he's saying, if you're fighting with flesh and blood, you're fighting the wrong battle. That could revolutionize the way you do marriage right there, folks. Could revolutionize the way you do family, the way we do church, the way we do citizenship in this country. Because our culture is full now of strife, right? So there's this other thing besides condemnation of intimidation. Whoever has the loudest voice, whoever has the Oz, whoever has their handles on the megaphone has this ability to move people. I'm going to intimidate you. I'm going to make you feel smaller. I'm going to make myself feel bigger because I have an agenda. Or how about this one? How about shame? How about the power of shame, man, to sell things? You know, back in the 1940s, there's some fascinating articles that are written, but marketing married psychology, and they had a baby, and its name was consumerism. Because before the 1940s, you only bought things because you needed them. After 1940, 45, you were buying things because you were a loser if you didn't have them. Remember the, remember the dandruff uh, head and shoulders commercials? Remember the ring around the collar commercials? It wasn't about that you, man, people were fine. Everybody had dandruff and everybody had ring around the collar. But now, now, <laughs> oh housewife, woe unto you if the secretary notices your husband with a ring around the collar. How dare you wash his shirts without, right? And shame was injected into the whole idea. What I'm saying is, is that marketing discovered a secret weapon to sell what they wanted to sell. Everything from sex to toothpaste. And it was shame. I'm going to move you to buy this product because of how you feel about yourself right now. There's an interesting article. David Brooks writes this op-ed writer in the New York Times. I referred to him a couple weeks ago. It's a great article, I can send it to you. I'm just gonna read an excerpt from it. He says, in a guilt culture, you know you're good or bad by what your conscience feels. Guilt is not always a bad thing because hopefully guilt leads me to the cross and to forgiveness. In a shame culture, however, you know you're good or bad by what your community says about you, by whether it honors or excludes you. In a guilt culture, people sometimes feel they do bad things. In a shame culture, social exclusion makes people feel they are bad. 
And then he, re- he cites an author from Christianity today, of all things, in the New York Times. And he says, Crouch argues that the omnipresence of social media has created a new sort of shame culture. The world of Facebook, Instagram, and the rest is a world of constant display and observation. The desire to be embraced and praised by the community is intense. People dread being exiled and condemned. Moral life is not built on the continuum of right and wrong. It's built on the continuum of inclusion and exclusion. And everybody is perpetually insecure in a moral system based on inclusion and exclusion. There is no permanent standard, just the shifting standard judgment of the crowd. He is describing middle school here, folks. He's describing our teen years. He's describing this court of public opinion. There's no longer any standard of whether I'm good or bad, whether I'm worthy or not, whether I'm somebody or not. Now it's just totally at the mercy of public opinion. It's a culture of oversensitivity, overreaction, and frequent moral panics during which everybody feels compelled to go along. And if we're going to avoid a constant state of anxiety, people's identities have to be based on standards of justice and virtue that are deeper and more permanent than the shifting fancy of the crowd. Shame. We live in a shame culture. Fat shaming and slut shaming and, and color shaming and, 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 and recycle shaming and vegetable shaming, meat shaming, and every kind of shaming we can, um, we can invent, right? And so we look for the court of public opinion. And so before I eat this plate of vegetables, I'm going to post it on my Instagram so that people don't think I'm just a bloodthirsty carnivore. <laughs> Please like me. And we joke. But in this city, there's been several suicides in just the last few months because of the power of shame to destroy a young person. It's not a game. It's not a game. This, this, this being, this enemy is behind it is, is playing for keeps. Like he said, Daniel said he's after faith. So then the word that describes everything is the word fear. It's a small word, but it, it, it's, it's the one that manipulates people. I, 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 w- I worked for two years on the ropes course at the YWAM, and we have a games where you give parts of the game for the whole team, and they have to come together, and they have to build it together. And I, and I was amazing to see, it, it, and I, I'm sorry to use these words, but always like the, the overweight kid or the one that doesn't dre- dress cool like the other kids, when we give the, the games, then they have to work together and then we, you explain and you say, listen, the only way you can finish this game is if everyone works together. And then I see this kid always, the, the overweight kid, the one that doesn't dress the same, doesn't have the same hair, he, he will step out of the, the group. And he will be watching the game. And then I will hear, I will stop pay attention on the group. I will pay attention on him. And then I will hear him say, wrong. You guys are going to the wrong side. You guys are putting the wrong parts. And by knowing the game, he was right. He was saying everything right. But because of shame, because I don't know how many times he's been rejected by the same group, he's, he doesn't have a voice to come and say it. Then I have to stop everyone and say, listen, there's only one person in your group that knows what to do. And then they all looking to each other because they, this person, is, it, it doesn't exist for the group. And then I say, it's him. They all look at us like, you? And then he say, yeah, put it this one, put it this one, put it here. And then the game is it's fixed. And everyone looks amazing and says, do you think? Do you have a voice? So that's, that is what the enemy, it, it, it does with, like, with a lot of people. By, by shame, by, by make them feel like you're not worth even to say anything. 
Imagine going into the, remember the story I just read about Babel? Imagine showing up where they're building the tower. You're a visitor, you're just passing through. And you just stop and say, hey, this is the dumbest idea I've ever heard. <laughs> you're not going to build a tower that reaches to the heavens. I don't, imagine just going to downtown Portland with your bright red Make America Great hat on <laughs> and just walking down on 4th Avenue and you know, just walking up to a group of young people and say, hey, that keep Portland weird thing, that's the dumbest slogan I've ever heard. You got, right? What I'm describing here is you're going to feel and you're going to encounter opposition, maybe literal from the people, or, but you're going to feel like, hey, do not go against the flow here. We've created this thing, right? You see what I'm saying? And so fear, he said, it causes you to lose your voice. Fear causes you to lose the understanding of your design and your identity. Fear robs you of your courage to obey. Fear robs you of a heart to trust. Remember the, was it the scarecrow that just, I need my heart back, I need my heart back? Because I'm afraid all the time. The lion wanted his courage. Fear robs your intimacy with God and fear ultimately, if left unchecked, can rob you of your destiny. There's a survey Daniel and I were talking about this week. And the survey, it, it's come from different angles. There's been several surveys done over the last five years, but in it they talked about that 50% of millennials feel like it's immoral to share your faith. Now, before you feel like I'm throwing millennials under the bus, let me explain that. But they said 50% of millennials, people under 30, feel it's immoral to say that my faith is right and your faith is wrong. I think that's a fascinating thing in our culture today. Now, part of me would understand that because it depends on what I'm describing. If I'm trying to get people to ascribe to cultural Christianity, I'd be slow to share my faith as well. If I'm trying to get people to ascribe to a Christianity that everybody is one particular party, political party now, I might be slow as well. But what's been lost is this idea of where's the truth in the middle of it all that actually overrides all other, all other truth. Where, where's Babylon and the kingdom of God come into view? Think about this. Jesus, he was... When Jesus was murdered, he was, it was on one side was the Jewish, the whole religious. Mm. And on the other side, it was the whole Rome, the, the, the politician on the time. And Jesus is between these two groups. One, one it's, it, it's, it's kind of like one is the enemy of, the, of each other. And Jesus is in the middle of this, right? Mm. And, and then Jesus is it's totally in a position of... You know, Jewish, you, Rome is not your enemy. And then he turn it to Rome and say, Rome, the Jewish is not your enemy. You are your enemy. It is not fighting against each other. And then I, I love that the man comes and say, Jesus, you know I have power to release you. And Jesus say, yes, because we gave it to you the power. You know, it, it's 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 not yours. It's, and 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 this is the idea of the kingdom of God. He's not he's not in favor of those in favor of this, but he's in favor of God. And and it is it's it's it's. I love that in the when you find the compass, you need to find a place. You need to find the north first mm -hmm. before you find where you have to go. And, and where Jesus is, is saying, and you see this tension, and for three years, disciples say, Jesus, I want to sit on your right side. Oh, I want to sit on your... Even the point of one of the disciples say, Mom, can you go and tell Jesus? <laughs> you know, there's not the struggle for this generation where parents need to go and work. That time it has the same. Like, John, come and Mom, can you tell Jesus I want to sit on his right side? And imagine Jesus like, oh, you guys don't get it. I'm not going to take Jerusalem. I'm not going to take the power. We're not going to fight Rome. We're bringing a new kingdom. It's the kingdom of God. 
You know, I, I don't want to go to this part, but it, this, this idea was so strong, the kingdom of God, that Peter and Paul said, hey, slaves, be good to your master. Master, be good to your slaves. They were not like, okay, what is the right and wrong? But it's like, see, this, this kingdom of God, if you apply it, then we will live in peace. That, that is like the, the source of life. We have to come from this king. As we finish, think about this idea and the things that steal your peace and steal your joy, steal your obedience. Aren't they things that come to you and claim to be right or wrong? Maybe the majority comes with a larger voice or multitude of voices. I want to put a quote up here. Like Adam and all his descendants, the temptation put before you and I is to decide for ourselves what is good and evil rather than what he just described. The temptation that all of us struggle with is we decide for ourselves what is good and what is evil. And that might depend on who we're listening to. But if you listen to the words of Jesus, he didn't come to destroy the liberals or to get the conservatives back in shape or back online. Listen to what he says. Dear children, John would write, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. And the one who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the work of the devil. So Paul's able to write from the prison cell, pray for me that I would declare the gospel fearlessly as I should. Man, that helps me so much. Because if the Apostle Paul, the writer of most of the New Testament, struggled with fear, I'm not in too poor a company. As we finish, I'm going to show a quick video clip. It's just a couple minutes long, but it's worth seeing. And this clip happened last week in Orlando, Florida. About 70,000 people gathered in a football stadium around an idea. And the idea was to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. It was called The Send. The conference was called The Send. And the idea that as the Son sends us, or the Father has sent me, Jesus said, so I send you. And so this clip is just, a, it's a longer clip. You can look it up on YouTube. There's a lot of stuff out there. Just Google in The Send. But this particular piece, I just wanted, when I saw it, I, we were talking and it struck us like, hey, the whole world doesn't think exactly like we're led to believe. Watch this clip and then we'll, we'll finish. We're inviting you to stand with us right now as a declaration before the Lord. To take your shoes off as a sign to the Lord that we are willing to go anywhere for the sake of the gospel. We have declared all day long that the war on inaction has begun. And it's not just a war on inaction, it's the replacement of inaction with the most extravagant, ridiculous, tenacious love that the world has ever seen. This is what we're declaring today. To hold our shoes before the Lord. How beautiful are the feet of those We are not a 
ashamed of the gospel. Are you ready? Are you ready? Here we go. One, two, three. the gospel, that Christianity thing. Do people still really believe that? You ever heard that? Well, 70,000 people in Orlando, Florida did last week. And we find ourselves parroting the words of Babylon. This didn't make the front page of CNN, oddly enough. Didn't make the front page of any news feed. But it happened last week. And this is just a slice of what the kingdom of God is up to. And I'm not saying that's the end of all things and that's the answer of all, but I'm saying that there is a whole bunch of people who have not bowed their knee to Babylon. We're going to take communion together when everyone is served. We'll take together. But as you approach these elements this morning, you're approaching the broken body and the shed blood symbolized by this cracker and this juice but you're approaching the Lord of all the earth who shed the blood of his son in order to redeem us. So would you take with reverence